election that God gave us, which is by grace, is talking about 100% nothing to do with me. It is completely out of or away from, not even a part of any of my good works. None of these things are what will make me righteous. The only thing that I need to be righteous is Jesus Christ. Everyone, if we could understand that, it is so easy. It is so peaceful. It is so amazing. And it is so powerful. Now, many people, when I say this, they say, but that's too easy. What? That's all there is to it? Man, that's not right because then there's no, there's no effort on your part. There's no responsibility on your part. There's no commitment on your part. There's a complete commitment when you trust only Jesus. What I mean by that is, if you're in an airplane, how many of you rode an airplane before? Most of you have, right? When you're on the airplane, what do you do? You watch the movie, drink the drinks, some of you read books, some of you take a nap, right? Yes? Yeah, it's no effort, but it's total commitment. You're committing your entire life into the hands of the pilot. Am I right? You're committing your worry to the pilot. What if the pilot goes to the wrong country? Do you know? No. All you did was follow the sign. Oh, the flight to Toronto is at gate 12. And you get on the plane, you sit, you put your luggage on the upper, upper compartment, you sit, put your seatbelt on, get relaxed, take off your shoes, maybe put on the slippers, and then you like put the little thing over your eyes and sleep. How do you know the pilot's taking you to Toronto? So what do you do? Completely trust everything to the pilot. That's total commitment. It's not the commitment to yourself. It's not a commitment to you improving yourself. That's a different commitment because that's not commitment. That's called foolishness because eventually I will fail. Eventually my determination will end. Do you know how I know this? Because we are born of this earth and born of this earth, we are bound by the realm of time. That's why you can't even stay young as much as you want. I'm 42 years old now. I can't run around like I did when I was 20. I want to. I want to jump. I want to play basketball like I, was, like I was 20. I want to be able to work at 2 or 3 in the morning every day and not feel tired and get over it really quickly because I'm young. I would love to travel to another country, get over jet lag in like 5 minutes like I did when I was, in, when I was 20. But I can't do that at 42, and I probably won't be able to do that when I'm 60. We have no control over this. You can't even stop yourself from aging even though you want to. So what, do you, what makes you think that you can maintain your righteousness? Man cannot maintain their righteousness. We are physically incapable. The beings that we have been created as on this earth are bound by time. And that's why no matter what action it is, there's a beginning, there's a duration, and there's an end. Even when I pay my taxes, I have to pay every year. When I pay tuition, I have to pay every semester. Why? Because the amount of money that I have is finite. Nothing is eternal. Nothing that comes from me is eternal. Therefore, how can I possibly, how can I possibly gain eternal life with actions that are not eternal? It is impossible. It doesn't make sense. It's two different values. Therefore, true commitment. True trust is trusting my salvation 100% to Jesus. If Jesus is good enough, then that is good enough. If Jesus' blood is shed, then that is more than good enough to wash away my sin. That is true commitment. That is true sacrifice. You're sacrificing everything. You're throwing away everything and relying, putting 100% of all your investment, all your hope, all your everything, your faith, your eternal life, what's going to happen? If Jesus fails, then I go to hell. But I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to trust God's way because I know God is perfect and therefore God cannot fail. So everyone, when you realize that we are people who cannot fulfill that standard, then we are people who will forsake ourselves. Then we will be people who truly repent of me, repent of Pastor Terry. Everyone, like I said, we're not even people who can make the sky stop raining. Yeah, if we go outside and it rains and we go, hey, rain, stop. Hey, sky, stop. What's going to happen? We're going to get wet and look like an idiot. We can't even control the weather. We can't even control our body temperature. When the virus enters your body, you can't even control whether you're sick or not. 
Why is everybody in lockdown and quote COVID-19, Corona? Because they can't stop the virus on their own. If they could stop, they would do it. How can you stop yourself from sinning? How can you earn your way to heaven? Heaven is the eternal place. And for us to be righteous, we have to be eternally righteous. You and I cannot get eternal righteousness through our effort because we are not eternal. Your actions are not eternal. And therefore, you cannot earn eternal life. So that is why if you think about it then, what is repentance? Repentance is waking up to the truth. Stop believing the false hope that I can do something to earn my salvation when I can't. And then the worst part is when pastors give their congregation members these kinds of words, it puts hope in themselves so they close their heart to Jesus who actually provided the eternal solution. And because they continue to believe in themselves, they continue to try, and they continue eventually fail. Because they experience this, Satan is able to like, condition them to believe that they will never be free from sin. So when it comes to listening to the Word of God, instead of accepting the Word of God exactly as it is, instead of accepting the promise that God has made us righteous, we compromise it. And because we've been preconditioned to believe we will never be righteous, what do we do? The people of our church, the congregation, people in this world, they go, yeah, Jesus meant for now. But then again, we're going to sin again and we're going to become unrighteous again. And so people are led to reject the truth. People are conditioned to always constantly believe that they are sinners. When the Bible is telling us, Jesus has freed us. Jesus has washed us. Jesus has died for my sin. So the first step of true repentance is to realize who I am. And when I realize who I am, then I'm able to repent in front of God. Then I'm able to have true commitment. People say to me so many times, that's too easy. If you make it too easy, people are going to sin however they want. Oh, people are just going to despise it. People are oh, that's too easy. You can't just become righteous like that. There's no commitment. 100% commitment to Jesus. And number two, if what you say is right, if me believing that 100% only by the blood of Jesus that I am made righteous and that God has eternally cleansed me, if I do, if, I, if believing in that is too easy, I would like to try an experiment with you, okay? So right now, <clears throat> all of you listening this morning, I want you to close your eyes, all right? Close your eyes, and I want you to imagine you dying. And then when you die, you go in front of Jesus, and then you tell him, I'm still a sinner because believing in your blood is not good enough. Go ahead. Try to tell Jesus that, yeah, I know you shed your blood, Jesus, but it wasn't enough to make me righteous. So I had to add my actions to it. I had to add my determination to it. I had to add my good works to it. And let's see how that conversation goes. When you tell Jesus face to face that your blood was not good enough to wash away my sin eternally. When you tell him your death was too easy. What? Just believe in Jesus dying on the cross? That's too easy. Now go ahead, tell Jesus that his death on the cross was too easy to make me saved. Oh, no, that's the, that way is too easy. I had to show my own sacrifice. I have to show my own goodness. Everyone, think about it. What we are saying by itself is ridiculous. And I'll tell you what that means. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this so passionately is because I lived this way for many years before I was able to hear the gospel. I live believing the same thing. And I fought so hard when I first met the Good News Mission and Pastor Oaks Park. I was 16 years old. But I fought so hard to reject everything he was saying to me. And it took literally six to eight months of like just constant fellowship to finally make me realize that what I was believing the whole time was not the truth. So what happened was, <clears throat> if, think about this, if... I am saying, yes, I believe Jesus Christ's blood was shed on the cross for my sin. However, I still have sin remaining, okay? And then that means going forward, I really need to pour all in my heart into stop sinning, to refrain from sinning. I need to be as sincere as possible, as sorry and regretful as possible when I ask for forgiveness. And then I must try my utmost best to not sin again. Let's say that what you're saying, let's analyze where this is coming from. 
Number one, if Jesus' blood is only good enough to wash away my sin up until now, that means going forward, what else can I use? If my, if my future sin is to be washed by my effort, if my future sin is to be washed by me asking for forgiveness as sincerely as possible, if my sin going forward is forgiven and washed by my determination and my ability to not sin again, what am I saying? I am saying that my good works, I am saying that my sincerity, and I am saying that my determination and effort to not sin again, that is at equal value as Jesus' blood, or better. I am saying my works are greater than the blood of Jesus. And some of you may be saying, no, that's not what I'm saying at all, Pastor. That is exactly what you're saying. That may not be the literal word you're saying, but that is the heart that we are carrying. That is the mindset we have. Now, what I mean by this, if you look here at John chapter 4, the woman, the woman, this Samaritan woman, when she first meets Jesus, what does she say about Jesus? Let's take a look here. And we read it here. Let's look at... <clears throat> Let's look at verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, Who is it, who is it that thou, how is it that thou, being a Jew, Askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. When this woman saw Jesus for the first time, what did she think about Jesus? Who did she see Jesus as? How did she see Jesus as a Jew? What is a Jew? Just another person. Just another human being. Just another man. Just another human, just like I am. So what does that mean, everyone? How do we see Jesus? If Jesus' blood truly is not enough to wash my sin eternally, then in my heart, Jesus is the same as me. Jesus' blood and my sincerity, they're at the same level. Actually, I'm saying my works are better. My sincerity is better. I'm saying that my determination, my effort is better. How am I saying that? Very simple. My, my effort, my sin, I mean, my effort, my sincerity, my asking God to forgive me, and my own goodness, if those things are going to wash my sin going forward, that's the sin that the blood of Jesus couldn't wash. That's the sin that the blood of Jesus was not powerful enough to wash. So therefore, it has to be washed by my confession. It has to be washed by my determination. It has to be cleansed and forgiven by my effort, by my good deeds. So you're saying that we are going to succeed where Jesus' blood failed? So everyone, if you really understand where this heart is coming from, it is the same thing as this Samaritan woman who saw Jesus only as a Jew. Only as a regular person. And because she saw Jesus as just a Jew, as just a regular man. That is why when Jesus says, give me to drink, and she says, hey, you're a Jew. Why are you talking to me? Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. Now, this is the second part. So when this woman saw Jesus as a Jew, she saw Jesus as just a normal other person. So when we go to church, we say Jesus this, Jesus that. I love Jesus, praise Jesus, we sing hymns about Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. However, what about the center of my heart, everyone? What about the center of your hearts? When we pray, thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Jesus is Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. We say all of these good things. But in our hearts, Jesus' blood only washed away my sin up until yesterday. Jesus' blood only washed my past sins away. But now my future sins have to be washed by my effort, by my determination, by my good works, by my sincerity. So the more sincere I pray, then God will listen to me. So my sincerity has more credit than Jesus' name. Do you know why we pray in Jesus' name? We pray in Jesus' name because 
God hears Jesus. So we don't pray in our own name. We pray in Jesus' name. But then in our hearts, we don't even believe in Jesus' name. So we have to be sincere with it. If we are not sincere, then God does not listen to my prayer. Everyone, is my sincerity greater than Jesus' name? God hears our prayer if we are righteous. God hears the prayers of the righteous, not righteous actors or people who do righteous deeds. God is the, listens to the prayer of the righteous, those who are born again, those who are dead as sinners but who by faith believe that God has made them righteous. So if I'm saying that my sincerity is going to get God to forgive me, if I'm saying that my determination is going to get rid of my sin, I am saying that I will succeed where Jesus' blood did not. Because if Jesus' blood is not good enough to wash away my future sin, but I am, then I'm saying that I did something that Jesus can't do. And therefore, in my heart, who is Jesus? Jesus is just a Jew. Jesus is just another man. Jesus is just a human being just like I am. He has faults just like I am. And then another thing she said was, in verse right here, let's look again, verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, Who is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. See, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. She's very aware of the fact that Jews look down on Samaritans. So what do, how do we live? Most people, even though they go to church, they live with God who condemns them. They're always afraid of the God who's angry at them. When they sin, when they lie, when they fall short, when they have mistakes, they are fearful of the God who's angry at them, the God who points their finger at them. But in the Bible, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, what does it say? Therefore now, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So whenever they look at themselves, when they commit weaknesses, when they have lackings, when they do sins, they commit sins, when they lie, when they are weak, what do they feel? Oh, God must be so disappointed in me. God must be so angry at me. Everyone, even from Genesis, after God, after the Noah's flood, what did God say? I have set a rainbow in the sky, for I will no longer judge man according to their actions, according to their deeds, because they are only evil continually. God, even from the time of Noah's ark, wanted to judge man differently. Of course, God gave us the law. And according to the law, God judged us as sinners. He gave us the official standard of how we know we are sinners. But God didn't just give us the law. God gave us the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the place where we would wash our sins. So we are not saved by our actions. We are not saved by whether we keep the law well or not. We are saved if we are washed by the blood of the Lamb. We are saved 100% if we are cleansed by the death of the sin offering. That's why God didn't just give us the law. The law leads us to the tabernacle. If you have broken one of the laws, then that means you are judged by the law. You are condemned. You are cursed. But at the same time, God provided the place where we can relieve that curse, where that curse gets washed. And that is the sin altar. The sin altar is where we will bring the offering for sin. And then our sins will pass over onto the offering. And when that offering dies in my place, the blood is put on the horns of the altar, spread out along the altar, and then the insides are burned and the animal and the sacrifice is completely burned where there's nothing left. Then my sin is forgiven. My sin is not washed by how well I keep the law. My sin is washed by the blood of the sin offering because God knows I will break the law. So when you look at it, it is a complete opposite way that God is seeing. So when God talks to us, He's talking to us from Terminal 1 in front of Gate 12. But when we're hearing the Word of God, we're still in Terminal 4 looking at Gate 12. Of course we're going to look at different things, and of course we are not going to see each other eye to eye. So that is why God wants us to repent. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways, thus saith the Lord. So return unto me. This is repentance, everyone. Just because you think something is good, you must realize that that did not come from God. When you think something is good, it came from your knowledge of, from, that came from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That is different than God. So us, even though we are saying one thing, but our heart is saying another. 
This is what it means here. Let's look at Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 17. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah chapter 17. Let's read verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Everyone. The heart is deceitful above all things. So you think you know what your heart is, but actually we do not. So people who say they believe in Jesus, and these are people who will defend their church. There are people who have been martyred for their religion. There are people who believed in Jesus and were killed by it. However, there are still many people who died for Jesus who still had sin in their heart who still saw Jesus only in a certain way that was not from the Bible. Everyone, I'm not trying to just despise people, but the most important thing is if we are going to be people who are going to preach the gospel, we have to be sure of this gospel. Everyone, <clears throat> what God is trying to tell us here is that this woman, this Samaritan woman, only saw Jesus first as a Jew. Now, as they have a conversation, later it changed. It changed to what? Oh, I can see that you're a prophet. So when Jesus told her, yeah, you have six husbands, and you married five, we're not satisfied, and now you're with your sixth man. <gasps> How did he know that? He knew something that's amazing. He knew my secret. How did he know that? Oh, my gosh. So then, then Jesus went from the status of a Jew to a prophet. Yes, there are many Christians and pastors. Right now, I would say that this phase of her changing from Jesus being a Jew to that Jesus being a prophet, yes, is a churchgoer. It's like a pastor, like an elder, like a deacon. Yeah, they know of God. They've experienced miracles of God. They received healing from God. They have received a lot of grace from God. They come to know more of the Bible. They're able to know more of the Bible story. They know of God in a deeper way than the normal person. However, people who just see Jesus as a prophet are people who are also not able to say that they are free from sin. It wasn't to the end of this conversation. At the end of this conversation, what happened? At the end of the conversation, verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Everyone, only then did she realize who Jesus was. <clears throat> Everyone, we may pray, we may read the Bible, but we have to look at the center of our hearts because we believe God with our heart. So this woman, when she first saw Jesus, the first thing she said was, you are a Jew. And therefore, she saw Jesus as a limited human being just like she was. Secondly, what happened? She said the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Everyone, if you think about it then, what is she saying? Ah, oh, this Jesus will surely not help me. The Son of God will never help me because I am a dirty, filthy human. Let me change my life first. Let me like change everything first. That is very similar to the prodigal son in the pig pen. He didn't want to return to his father because in his mind he thought, my father would surely reject me. My father would surely be angry because I wasted all of the inheritance that I received from him. I wasted it. I lived, wasted on riotous living, living a dirty, filthy life. I wasted everything on my sins. So what did he do? He tried to work to get his money back. He tried to work in a pig pen to at least earn some money, to at least earn something because he cannot go back to his father as a dirty sinner who failed this way. But you have to understand that that is the very reason, that is the very thing that Jesus wants, actually. Jesus actually wants us to come to him. <clears throat> the second thing is, she saw Jesus as a prophet. Yes, now it's shifted from, oh, a Jesus who condemns me, a Jesus who will not like me, a Jesus who's Jew who's limited. But then it changed, right? As she started seeing good things, beneficial things. So a lot of people come to church for the social interaction. They come to church because they hear good messages, good words, and they feel good about themselves. They like praise and worship. These things are all good, and they see them as prophets. Yeah, they're talking about something special. They're talking about the Word of God, but still in their heart their sin remains. Only when Jesus becomes the Savior can they say that they are free from sin. But how do they know that Jesus is their Savior? How can they know this? Well, that is what the Bible is trying to tell us. This, as long as people say that they have sin in their heart, that means they have not met a Savior. They are still living in sin. They're still struggling with sin. But let's talk about this. If you look here very closely... <clears throat> Many people, first thing I want to talk about is that God came for sinners. 
So what does this mean? As long as she saw Jesus as a Jew, she could not come to Jesus freely because Jewish people despise Samaritans, and she knows this. A lot of people, they, are, they live with sin, and they feel that they cannot come to church. That church is a place they feel a lot of burden. And then when they pray, they pray with tears, God, please forgive me. And there's so many people who live with this condemnation in their heart. There's so many people who live in darkness. There are so many people who live with shame and fear because the churches look down on them. Because they come to church and all they hear is, you shouldn't do this, you should be like that, you shouldn't do that, God hates sinners, God condemns sinners, all sinners must go to hell. Everyone, people don't go to hell because of the sin. They go to hell because they did not accept Jesus as their Savior. Now this is something that I know is a controversial, but I want you to like listen out, listen to the end first. So we can see here that Jesus is our Savior, everyone. So the reason why people go to hell is not because of the sin. It is because they did not believe that Jesus is their Savior. And that is the reason why people live in sin. Now I would like to discuss this. So if you think about it here, people are ashamed to come to Jesus because they have so many sins. People feel like, oh, let me change my life first, then God will accept me. Let me dedicate my, let me stop smoking, let me stop drinking, let me change my lifestyle, let me get more into the church, let me start reading the Bible more, let me get on a regimen, and let me control, self-control more, and let me, you know, change my heart first, stop alcohol, let me stop all this, and then I will believe in God. Everyone, that is not the time we go to a doctor. We don't go to the doctor after we heal. We don't call a plumber in our house after we fix the plumbing ourselves. If we fix the plumbing ourselves and it works properly, then it's a waste of the plumber's time to come to my house. It's the same way. Everyone, if we really believed Jesus was our Savior, then why is it we're trying to save ourselves before we go to the Savior? Then why are we trying to work for our salvation before we go to Jesus? If we truly believed and accepted Jesus as the position of my Savior, then I'm supposed to go to Jesus when I need saving, when I'm in the middle of my sin. But when we live in front of God trying to fix ourselves before we go to God, that is not believing Jesus is our Savior. That's like holding Jesus as a prophet. Yeah, a prophet is a goodly person, so we want to be good in front of the prophet. We want to be sincere in front of the prophet. So then we feel and we measure ourselves compared to that. But that's not the truth. The truth is, God is our, Jesus was our Savior, and Jesus came to save sinners. So the people who truly pleased God, the people who truly made God happy to meet, were sinners. Sinners that needed to be saved by Jesus. And you have to also understand, a Savior needs sinners who cannot save themselves. Now, all the time in America, you hear this plenty of times, God only helps those who help themselves. That is not biblical, 100%. That has not come out ever, ever in any translation of the Bible in the history of the Bible. That is a construct made up by man. That is man's goodness mixed with the word of God. That is a corrupt, corrupt mindset. God does not help those who help themselves. That is not grace. If you could help yourself and you do help God, that means it's a wage. God saves us by grace through faith. God is our Savior, not our helper. God is not our assistant. God is not there to fill in the gaps that we can't do. God is our Savior because we cannot save ourselves. And you really have to internalize this. We are people who have failed. Only then can we come to God. Imagine if you never sinned, not one sin. Let's say you never broke the law. If you never broke the law, you do not need the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the entrance, as soon as you enter the tabernacle, there's the sin altar. What does the sin altar do? It's where you give your offering from sin. If you've never committed sin, you don't need the sin altar. So therefore, people need to acknowledge that when I have sinned, that is the perfect time that Jesus has to work. So Satan leads us to go away from God instead of going to God. Satan tells us, hey, don't go in yet. First fix everything and then go in. Hey, 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 you're too sinful. Hey, hey, you're too this. You're too that. Hey, no, no, that sin is too big. Let's, let's, let's calm down. Let's reduce it. Let's change a little bit. Let's change our habits. Let's try this and let's change this. And then God will accept you. Why does he do that? Because he wants to keep us from our Savior. He wants to keep us from God saving us. 
So this Samaritan woman, she saw Jesus as a Jew, and therefore she didn't want to talk to him. She was burdened by him. And we see Jesus as this angry person who's always condemning us. See, I died for you, and how could you live like this? No, no, no. When Jesus saw us, he sees us as helpless little lambs about to be eaten by wolves. He sees us as people who cannot do anything for ourselves. And that is why Jesus is our Savior. So the first thing we must realize, that Jesus is not happy. Jesus is not excited when we do things well, when we're changing and stopping our sin on our own. That is not when Jesus works. Jesus works when we cannot work. And that is the beginning of acknowledging that Jesus is our Savior. Acknowledging that Jesus is a Savior means we need to be saved. And so this woman, this Samaritan woman, she's still trying. She's still trying, asking God, okay, give me this water. I'll take the water. I'll take the everlasting water. Give it to me. Give it to me. I'll do it. Okay, from now on, if I just drink that water, I'll be fine. Again, she's just believing in her determination. She is trusting in herself. So then Jesus is continually having a conversation. Continually having a conversation. Because the water that Jesus is talking about is not physical water that you drink. Jesus finally, finally, as they talk about this and that, and she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. And Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah. And then, boom, it hit. Oh, Jesus is the Messiah. At that moment, something completely changed in her heart. She dropped the bucket right there. Not one drink of water did she get. She left the bucket, went straight into the town, and preached the gospel, told every single person in that village, in that town, who Jesus was, and made them all come out to hear Jesus. Everyone, the hope had already entered her heart. That living water had finally entered her heart. That living water was the promise of God, was the word of Jesus. And so when you think about it, Jesus finally became the level of Savior to this woman. And when Jesus reached the level of Savior in this woman's heart, this woman could not be the same. This woman completely changed. Everyone, who is Jesus in your heart? If you still feel that you have sin, if you are people who are still struggling with sin, that means you are not trusting Jesus as your Savior. Because if you're trusting Jesus as your Savior, and you have 100% only on the blood of Jesus, then you would be totally committed to Jesus. It's not hard. It's not difficult. You do that every time. Every time you ride an airplane, you trust yourself 100%. You trust the pilot and you trust the engineers who repaired the plane. You trust the engineers who made the plane. You trust the mechanics who fixed the plane. You trust the end, you, you already. And you do it without any effort. Because when you're on an airplane, you just lie back, watch the movie, drink your drink, eat your snack. And then if you're flying internationally, then you eat the meal that they prepare for you. And you just have a great ride. Am I right? Watch movies, type in papers, read books. Why? <clears throat> because you have trusted everything, your whole life. You even trust the destination 100% to the pilots, 100% to the people who fixed the airplane, the people who made the airplane. Everyone, if we can trust the pilot 100% and have total rest in our heart when we fly in an airplane, why can't we trust Jesus Christ with our salvation? Why can't we trust Jesus Christ with our our eternal redemption. Why is it that we're still drawn by the same thoughts? Yeah, maybe Jesus washed up my sin up until yesterday, but from now on, I have to wash my sin. <coughs> I have to work hard for Jesus to forgive my sin. I have to do this. I have to do that. Why do we continue to fall into those thoughts, believing that we have to do something if we really believe that Jesus is our Savior? And everyone, you have to understand, because Jesus is our Savior, that means He wants us to be saved from our sin. We are supposed to be sinners, and Jesus is to save us from our sin. So let's take a little bit more deeper look into the Scripture. Let's look at John, chapter 9, verse 41. <clears throat> Now, before we read verse 41, I want to read John chapter 9. We'll start from verse 35. Jesus heard that they cast him out 
And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see, and they which see might be made blind. Sorry, one more time. And Jesus said, For, I, for judgment I am come into this world, they, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? In verse 41, And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now what does it say? Now this is very interesting. So we're supposed to be blind to say our sins are forgiven? No, what this means is, because you see, and because you believe what you see, and because you exalt what you see, and what you see is everything, that is why your sin remains. So because you still see that fleshly Jesus, Jesus has two arms and two legs. Jesus even asked the Samaritan woman, can I have something to drink? Jesus was tired from walking in the wilderness, and he was actually resting at the dwell in, outside of Samaria. So if, you, so, so if you think about it, Jesus looked like a human. Yes, he was a human. He had flesh. He had hunger. He had tiredness, fatigue, just like we did. And so you can see here, because she saw that image, what happened? She saw Jesus just as a Jew. And then she knows from her past experience that Jewish people despise Samaritans. Oh, Jesus surely will not like me. This Jewish guy surely is not supposed to like me. And then later she saw Jesus as a prophet. So what she was seeing was blocking her from actually seeing. Yes, many people go to church and there are many pastors who know a lot of Bible verses. Some pastors even memorize more Bibles than Bible verses than I did. But if those pastors cannot see Jesus as their eternal Savior, then what good is their vision? What good are all the Bible verses that they memorize? We can't, memorizing a lot of Bible verses doesn't help me when I don't see what God is wanting me to see. Because if God doesn't, if I cannot see what God is showing me, that means I am blind. But people who know, well, you know what? Actually, you and I, look at yourself, okay? Look at yourself. Do you see sin on you? You see the action of sin that you've committed, but can you see if your sin has been removed or not? You cannot see it, right? You do not have physical eyes to see it. But everyone, look around you. Look around you. You see lights, you see everything, right? Well, everything that you're seeing with your eyes are just different spectrums of light. So these spectrums of light bounce off an object, and when the light reflected off an object enters into my eye, the eye processes the information that's reflected in the light. Your eyeball sees light. It doesn't see the object. That's why when you turn off the light, you don't see anything. But your eyes will see what's reflected with light because your eyes see light. They don't see the actual object. So the light and the image carried by the reflection of the light enters my brain, and then my brain interprets the light that I see. So if you think about it then, how do you see things? If I'm seeing things through my way, my own eyes, that's the same thing as being blind. So what God is saying is, though, if you acknowledge that, oh, you know what, I don't have the eyes to see sin. I never have, and I never will. Human beings do not have the physical eyes that can see sin. But God does. God cannot hide the fact that he sees sin. God has the eyes to see sin. So you may hide sin from me. You may hide sin from your parents. You may hide sin from other people. And you may even forget it yourself. And you may even convince yourself that it is not a sin, which we do all the time. However, you cannot deceive God because God sees sin. Now, if God sees sin and he says you have no sin, that is very different from me saying I have no sin. That is why everyone, I'm not telling you as a pastor that you have no sin. I am telling you that God is promising you that you have no sin. That God has washed away your sin. Everyone, this is what I wanted to share with you. If you can see Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you will know part of the process of you that needs to be fulfilled to be saved. Now let's talk about this then. <clears throat> let's look at Acts Chapter 3. Now, so basically what I'm talking about here is that Jesus says to the Pharisees, 
you see, and that's why you still say you have sin. But if you acknowledge that you are blind, that you don't see accurately, hey, if God says I have no sin, then I have no sin. If you're able to acknowledge this, then your sin will be washed. Your sin will be forgiven. But because you see, that is why your sin still remains. So if you think about it, Jesus washed our sin. So why is it that our sin remains? Because we are walking by our sight and not by faith. So let's take a look here. Acts chapter 3. Let's read verse 18. Acts chapter 3, verse 18. But those things which God beforehand showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. So Peter is saying, all the prophecies that were made about Jesus Christ, Jesus fulfilled. Did he only fulfill part of them? No, he fulfilled all of them. So let's talk about one of those prophecies. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. If you look at Isaiah chapter 53, let's read starting from verse 4. Okay, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So what did he bear? He bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Everyone, what does that mean? He carried, right? It means Jesus physically has them, right? Let's read again. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The chastisement of our peace. What does this mean? Okay, we committed sin. Jesus never committed a sin. Not a single sin. Jesus never sinned. We are the ones who sinned. Am I right? But it says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. That means the chastising, the judgment of sin that I was supposed to receive, that beating was given to who? Jesus Christ. Jesus took the punishment for sin. Why? That comes out in verse 6. The reason why by his stripes we are healed, the reason why the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and the reason why he was bruised for our iniquities, the reason why all of that is possible is because of verse 6. Now let's read verse 6 together. So on your screen, please read it out loud. Ready? One, two, three. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Where did the Lord? The Lord is talking about God, am I right? Where did God put our sin? He laid it on him. This him is Jesus Christ, our Savior. So it says very clearly, Peter in Acts chapter 3 said everything, every prophecy that Jesus was supposed to fulfill, he fulfilled. Amen? That means the prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 53, that he will receive all the chastisement for our sin, they will be upon Jesus. Why is our chastising on Jesus? Because that is where God put our sin. God placed all our sins onto Jesus. And because Jesus is the one carrying my sins, He is also carrying my sorrow. He is also carrying my iniquities. And that is why He had to be chastised. That is why He was bruised. He was bruised and He was chastised. In other words, He had fulfilled the judgment of God. There is no more judgment left because Jesus accepted it and finished it so perfectly, there's nothing left. What does this mean? That means Jesus, God, means God took out all his anger. He released, unleashed every single ounce of the wrath of God all on Jesus. That's why Jesus was torn. That's why he was whipped 40 times and his flesh torn to pieces, bleeding everywhere. That's why he died miserably suffocating on the cross. And that's why even his sides were pierced by a spear. Jesus Christ received all the anger of God so perfectly that God can't even be angry anymore. 
all his anger was spent already. It was already given. There's nothing else to be angry about because he all got it out. He released his wrath. He released the punishment and the chastisement all on Jesus. And Jesus took all of it. Jesus accepted every ounce of God's anger. He accepted so much of God's anger, God he ain't even angry anymore. God can't even get angry anymore. He used it all. He accepted it all. There's no way, there's no more anger for God left because it's all been taken out. God's not angry at anything anymore. That's how perfectly Jesus washed our sin. That's how perfectly Jesus was the offering for our sin, everyone. And that's why if you go back here, let's take a look here. <clears throat> now I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be reading verse 21. We're not going to read in order. First I'm going to read verse 21 and then I'm going to read verse 17. Okay, so we're going to start off with verse 21. Verse 21 says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Everyone, what does this mean? This is explaining exactly what is being said in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. Okay? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so what this means is, he, verse 21, for he has made him, this him is talking about Jesus, the he is talking about God. For God has made Jesus to be sin for us. That's a confirmation of what God prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. God took the sins that we committed and he put it on Jesus. And by putting our sin on Jesus, God made Jesus the sinner. Everybody understand? That means, what is it here? Who knew no sin? That's right. Jesus didn't sin. But instead, God put our sin onto Jesus who didn't sin himself so that God could carry, so Jesus could carry all of our sin and he became the sinner. And that is why he was crucified on the cross. And by him doing that, what happened? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This him is Jesus. In because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did, he re God removed our sin and put it onto Jesus. Now Jesus became the sinner. And what did Jesus do? He didn't just take away our sin. No, 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 no. He didn't just leave us naked. He didn't just remove the clothes and the robes of sin and put it on Jesus. Instead, what did God do? God took the righteousness of Jesus and covered you and I with the righteousness of God. Everyone, this is very important. What's the difference between the righteousness of God and the righteousness of man? Let's talk about this. I only have a couple minutes left, but we'll be able to fit it in. <clears throat> now, what I want to talk about is very clear, right? So if you look in the Bible, there is a story about Jesus meeting a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years suffered a lot, right? It says that she suffered of many physicians, but she didn't get better. So what had happened? She said to herself, if I could just touch, if I could just touch the hem, the bottom of Jesus' clothes, I will be healed. So she went, broke through the crowd, touched the bottom of Jesus' garment. But the moment she touched Jesus' garment, the power of God left Jesus and entered her, and she was healed, right? We know that so far, right? But why is this significant? And I'll tell you why this is significant. If you go to the book of Leviticus, there is the law that God gave Moses. Now, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, but there are also 603 additional laws that God had given man. God gave man laws about what animals to eat. He gave laws to man about how to shave your beard, what clothes you could wear, what clothes you could not wear. So one of the laws that God gave Moses to people, which means it's in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, is called the law of the cleansing of the person who has an issue of blood. Now, if a woman has an issue of blood, every day that that issue is flowing, every day that the blood is flowing, she is considered unclean, unclean. Anything she touches becomes unclean. Anyone she touches becomes unclean. As long as that issue of blood is running, everything she touches is unclean, everyone. But the interesting thing is, if the law, according to the law, 
when she touched Jesus, Jesus is now supposed to be unclean. Am I right? But that's not what happened, is it? No, because when she touched Jesus, Jesus' righteousness didn't become unclean. Jesus' righteousness made her clean. Why? Because Jesus' righteousness is not of the law. It's not different than man's righteousness. Jesus' righteousness never changes, everyone. If sin touched Jesus' righteousness, then that righteousness, that sin, changes and becomes clean. It dries up. It disappears. Because Jesus' righteousness is greater than sin. So the righteousness that God gave us this time is not the righteousness of man. What's the righteousness of man? The moment I could be righteous for 20 years, but the moment the issue of blood comes, what happens? Now I'm unclean. And even if that woman who has, I don't have the issue of blood, if a woman has an issue of blood and she touches me, my righteousness becomes unclean. Why? Because that's the righteousness of man. So the righteousness of man becomes unclean when we do sinful deeds. When we commit sinful acts, yes, we become unrighteous. The problem is, when we go to heaven, we cannot go to heaven by the righteousness of man. Because the righteousness of man already failed. We know that. How do we know that? Adam and Eve became sinners. Adam and Eve ate the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Once they rejected the word of God, listened to Satan, the righteousness of man died and man became a sinner. And so we are unclean, everyone. The moment we can be good, we can be righteous, we can live a good life for like, what, one year, ten years? But as soon as we sin, what happens? We go back into condemnation. Why? Why is it that we feel like we're sinners again and again? Because we only rely on man's righteousness. In our heart, we are only covered by the righteousness of man. But it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God made Jesus to be the sinner in our place. He removed all our sins onto Jesus. And in that place of the sin, God gave us His righteousness. Amen? The same righteousness that when the woman who had the issue of blood touched Jesus, Jesus didn't become unrighteous. Instead, that righteousness made her righteous. That is the new righteousness that God gave us. The eternal righteousness of God. So now, everyone... That can only happen in our heart when we accept that Jesus is our Savior. So at first, Jesus was just a Jew to the woman. And then later, as they had more conversation through the words of Jesus, he became a prophet. And then through more conversation, finally, through the words of Jesus, she believed that he was the Savior. And that is when she was able to accept the righteousness of Jesus as her own righteousness. Everyone, most importantly, Jesus has to change in our heart. The image of ourself has to change in our heart. Then we will experience the amazing works of God. Uh, we'll, pray, we'll finish here and let us pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we truly thank you for blessing us. We truly thank you for giving us the perfect sal salvation. We thank you for giving us the most powerful Savior. We thank you that you have placed all our sin onto Jesus. And as it says in the book of Acts, every prophecy that Jesus was supposed to fulfill, he completely fulfilled it perfectly so perfectly that there's no more wrath. There's no more chastisement left. There is no more condemnation because Jesus literally sucked it out of God completely. He absorbed it all. He received it all. There is therefore no condemnation because of how perfectly Jesus paid for everything. Jesus just took the wrath of God, absorbed it, and completely resolved it. That is why Jesus is our perfect and eternal Savior. Lord, let this faith and to the heart of any, every person on earth, everyone in America, every pastor, every uh, church leader, every Christian leader, may he be able to also receive the righteousness of Jesus by faith in their hearts. God, we truly thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you very much, and we'll see you again next time.